I'm Dan Jones from Milwaukee Public Television. Our program today has kind of a strange title. It's called Milwaukee Water Summit for the Blue Footprint. Let me explain why. A few years ago, a group called the Milwaukee Water Council was formed to bring attention to the fact that we're a big city on the shores of the largest freshwater supply in the world. Well, they think that not only do we have access to the water, we have the production facilities, the technology, the brain power to let the rest of the world know that we are at the forefront when it comes to preserving and promoting this increasingly valuable natural resource. So this summer, the group held its fourth major get together here and they unveiled the term the blue footprint. They hope that becomes ingrained in the international dialogue about water, sort of like carbon footprint has become when we talk about energy consumption, energy usage. What we want to do is bring you some of the highlights of this discussion because it's increasingly important, not only here in Milwaukee, but in the entire world. Milwaukee's history is one that's all about water. In the late 1800s, Milwaukee was founded on wet industries. We were the tannery capital of the United States. We were the brewery capital of the United States. And also at that time, there were a lot of little companies that started in Milwaukee serving those wet industries, making pumps and filters and valves and all the things that wet industries need. Uh, my company, Badger Meter, started that way. A couple German immigrants were making parts from Miller Brewing and realized they could make a better water meter. Today, 100 years later, 100 and some years later, we've lost our tanneries, most of our breweries are gone, but all those little water companies over the past 100 years have grown into what today is the largest concentration of water companies in the world that we can find. Uh, we're very impressed with that, and we realized that if we came together and worked together, uh, we could grow this, this segment. And it's not only that, but it's the fact that for the last 100 years, water hasn't been important. The attitude about water was, if you want water, dig a hole. You, you'll always hit it. Out west, yeah, there were concerns. But east of the Mississippi, nobody cared about water. And in the world, water wasn't a big concern. Today, we are recognizing that water is very valuable. Water is more valuable than oil in most places of the world. Uh, you know, people say water will be to the oil of the 21st century. I disagree. There are plenty of substitutes for oil. There's wind, there's solar. There is no substitute for water. You can't live for three days without water. And you know what? Not that many people are dying from lack of oil, but every 15 seconds a child dies from lack of clean, fresh water. And that's, that's a crime, and that's something that has to be addressed. And we believe that here in Milwaukee, we have the talent, we have the companies, we have the technologies that can help solve the world's water problems. So four years ago, we came together in a room like this as a group. It was a much smaller group. We said, what can we do? How can we work on this? And over the last four years, we've grown the Water Council dramatically. And you're going to hear today that we've got some new members and some new opportunities for the Water Council that we're very excited about. And over those four years, while we've been working on that, the world has been waking up about water. They've been recognizing just how important water is. And that's why we're in the right place at the right time. The work of the Water Council, I'll remind you, is focused on three things. One is economic development. We would like to see the economy in southeastern Wisconsin develop around water technology. We want to create jobs and opportunities for ourselves, for our children and our grandchildren. The second thing is about talent development. We want to get the kids in this region to study water, and we want to have jobs for them when they graduate, and we want to keep that talent and keep those brains in this region. And the third thing is about technology development, finding solutions to the world's water problems. That means working with the researchers in the area. That means working with the companies in the area. There are a lot of areas of the world that do a lot on water research. Singapore is a hub of water research. Israel is a hub of water research. But they don't have manufacturing. And as anybody who's in the manufacturing business understands, there's a special connection between being able to do research at a place where you're actually doing the manufacturing. And having the researchers working directly with the manufacturers is extremely important. And the professors understand that having companies in town that they can actually work with to get products manufactured helps them do new developments faster. In Milwaukee, we have a concentration of over 120 water technology companies. Five of the 11 largest water technology companies in the world have major operations here. This is a huge center for water, and this is a center that we're going to continue to work on. One interesting thing is I was in Pittsburgh about a month ago, and they introduced me as Rich Mewson, who's from Milwaukee, which is the World Water Hub, which I thought was interesting. Anytime, any, thank you. 
anytime I'm in Milwaukee, I get introduced as Rich Musin, the guy who's trying to make Milwaukee into a world water hub. So this is one of those things where you got to get at least 50 miles from home to be appreciated or something. But I thought that was really interesting. And everybody in the audience went, oh yeah, we've heard of Milwaukee. So again, it's one of those things where we've got, we've got a much better focus, out, a much better reputation outside our area than within. We need to make sure that even in this area, we, we realize how important this is. So what is the blue footprint? It's simple and complicated. Bottom line is we all need water. We all use water, and our use of that water has an impact on the environment, the economy, and our ability to sustain our resources in the future. In Milwaukee, we're a fortunate position. We sit right on the world's largest source of fresh water. We have a concentration of water technology companies, and extensive research and academic resources for water Thanks to some great universities, and I really want to emphasize universities, technical colleges and schools, research facilities in our region. We are very, very blessed to have multiple assets that way. If any place can command, uh, take the blue, front, blue footprint issue for, the f issue for the future, we can. And that's why we're here today. This is the fourth water summit, the time when we meet around a shared and lofty goal making Milwaukee the freshwater capital of the world. It's remarkable to see and be part of increasing our momentum toward that goal and building on the foundation that has been set in years past. We have world-class colleges and universities here. We have respected companies. At last count, more than 120 water companies in the area. Our universities and our businesses are leading the charge and have brought on so many others to build a network of change for a better Milwaukee and a better region. This partnership truly showcases the best that Milwaukee has to offer. This is the kind of model that we must continue to promote, bringing together business with our colleges and universities and matching city, state, and federal support with private dollars. This is one of my major priorities, and I've made it clear to my colleagues who are in a position to help. The federal government must be a partner in this great effort. Together we have an opportunity to ensure the vitality and prosperity of Milwaukee for generations to come. Together we can and will turn Milwaukee into the Silicon Valley for water, water technology. And just as the technology produced in Silicon Valley is in use all around the world, the benefits of this venture will be felt here and abroad. When we're done, Milwaukee will, know, will be known not only for beer, but also for water, and may I also say as the champions of the National Basketball Association. <laughs> <laughs> Our topic today, the blue footprint, is timely. As you know, in Washington, we're struggling with how to be, be better stewards of our resources, as well as smarter with our energy. There are similarities between energy and water. We know that water is just as scarce, if not more so, than oil. However, we don't have 40 years to debate how to tackle the problems associated with water. The time is now when Wisconsin is uniquely poised to take a leading role. And that is why this summit, the Milwaukee Water Council, and the goal of making Milwaukee a water technology and policy hub is so very important. Most of you already know that we've been working together for some time to bring home federal funding for various water initiatives. And each year we've been able to help give shape and resources to this effort. Over the past few years, we've been able to secure about two and a half million dollars, and this year we hope to do even more. Working with the leadership in this group, I submitted a funding request for five million dollars. This money will be a first step toward a center of excellence for water technology and enable our students and businesses to interact create the new products that will revolutionize this industry and create even more new jobs and businesses. Our status as a UN compact, global compact city, recognized worldwide for our expertise in water technology is helping other regions and other no na nations take notice. Over the past year, we have hosted delegations that included rep representatives from China to Bangladesh to Maldives, as well as the Australian Consulate General in Chicago. We're attracting international visitors here, but we're also headed abroad. 
In recent weeks, we have participated in the launch of the Alliance for Water Stewardship Roundtable in Brussels, as well as attending World Water Week in Singapore. As part of our ongoing work and attendance at exhibitions and conferences all over the world. Making a difference within our region is very critical for companies, research, and uh, talent. As we continue to expand upon our world hub for water education, one of the highlights has been the addition of the UWM School of Freshwater Sciences. It's a huge step in that direction. This school is the first of its kind in North America, and, and in just a few weeks, the first class pursuing graduate degrees in freshwater sciences will begin their work at UWM and provide companies around the region with highly qualified employees. Water is infinitely renewable, but it's limited in space and time. It is a finite resource, and it's very low in substitutability. There's not much else you can water crops with, but it's very high in demand elasticity. If it gets more expensive, people do change behavior and use patterns. Longage versus shortage. Uh, there always will be a shortage of cheap water. Another way to say that is there's a longage of demand. And that's beginning to dawn on policymakers in different places that will never solve the problem if the resource is undervalued. It's got to be valued in a market sense, in an economic sense, somewhere close to reality. Uh, undervalued resources cause a misallocation, and we're always then going to be underinvesting in efficiency improvements if it's too cheap. That doesn't argue for uh, a lack of concern for equity, though, that it is possible to use, uh, you know, even subsidized lifeline rates for an essential amount of water and then bump your way up. And so those increased tiered rate structures are a very good way to solve for both the economic. Uh, return that's required and social equity. Local sources first imported water. A lot of our thinking, as my North American replumbing diagrams show, uh, a lot of the thinking has been on go import water from somewhere. And most of the thinking now is use local water supplies. And you think about it, when it has to be treated to higher and higher quality levels, that actually advantages local sources. If you've got local groundwater and it does have some issues, but it's still treatable and usable, and the alternative is import water uh, for somewhere else or go for more expensive sources, and then you still have to treat it, you're actually advantaging local sources. That's going to change some of the water dynamic, I think, in terms of local versus imported. That also leads to diseconomies of scale. That is, that there are diseconomies to large systems relative to small systems in many places in the world, and that, I think, creates a business opportunity. That means a bigger isn't always better uh, or more optimal. And uh, you deal with some, the, some of the sunk capital problems, that is, having to invest very large amounts of uh, resources and capital uh, for systems and then have to deal with amortizing that over a long period of time, break it into smaller bite-sized pieces. Technology improvements mainly are at the end use side. We're not seeing vast new advances, to my knowledge, in uh, dam building and major conveyance systems, but we're seeing huge and dramatic increases in opportunities through technology for water use efficiency, measurement, control, filtration, and so forth. Uh, and a lot of those, again, lead to decentralized advantage, uh, end use advantage, and local supply advantage. So my stirring conclusions here. In 1990, about 20 years ago, Roger Revelle and Paul Wagoner, two of the, uh, the senior figures in the climate science world, uh, this is Commander Revelle, the one that uh, actually got Keeling to go to measure the CO2 in Mauna Loa uh, at Scripps Institute. These guys said, they're scientists, 20 years ago, governments at all levels should reevaluate legal, technical, and economic procedures for managing water resources in the light of climate changes that are highly likely. I'm intrigued that they zeroed in on the legal, technical, and economic procedures. Most people are thinking build bigger levees, build seawalls, and, and so forth. Uh, they were, they were uh, realizing 20 years back, we need to rethink our institutions, and I think that's exactly right. We need to integrate planning for water, energy, climate change, the economy, and the environment, all in one package. And we need to really think about tapping into local opportunities to build the resilience that we're going to need. So let me close with uh, one of my favorite Winston Churchill quotes, people and nations behave wisely once they've exhausted all other alternatives. And it does seem to me that that's kind of where we are. 
Uh, I know I have a, a brief video clip that, that shows some of uh, the, 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 water, the leaders that are reflecting on, this, uh, on the importance of water at the global stage, some of which were involved in this effort. Um, uh, I think the important thing is that you know, it's trying not to be siloed with this. It's involved uh, uh, leaders and figures from, uh, from all different sectors and all different uh, uh, stakeholder groups. Uh, so if that's okay, let's, let's just uh, run this uh, quick, quick clip if that's all right. Water is so important for all aspects of economic and social development. It is absolutely crucial to our growth and sustainability. It's also the most important individual factor for the sustainability of humankind. You can live without television, without a car, without a bicycle, without extra clothes. You can't live without water. Yet, society is currently using one of our most precious resources on the planet unsustainably. There are limits to what our natural systems can provide, and the strains are beginning to show. The water issue is starting to impact people right now. We're increasingly getting uh, periods of drought and, and drought stress on plants all around the world. In Australia, the amount of water available for use is now 30% of what it was 10 years ago. In California, a lot of the farmers have simply not been able to get the, the water that they need to grow the crops that historically they've grown. London, uh, for example, has, has had to consider a desalination plant to cover peaks. Uh, Atlanta is shutting down power plants uh, during the hot summers. There are clear and visible signs of stress now, but what will the picture look like in 20 years if we do not take concerted action? There will be something like a 40% gap uh, between su supply and demand uh, on a global scale by 2030. Nobody says solving the water challenge will be easy, but what are the major barriers ahead? How will we overcome them to unlock new and existing solutions? The challenge of protecting water resources and, and using them responsibly is, is important, yet extremely complicated. Demands placed on the system are unique to each country. It is estimated that without efficiency gains in 2030, 80% of India's total water demand will come from agriculture. In contrast, China's water gap will be driven by the doubling of water demands from both industrial and power generation, as well as an urbanizing middle class. It will take a mix of innovation of new and existing technologies and techniques combined with smart policies. The key thing is that governments have to have the right amount of data and the right quality of data to be able to start making those decisions on the right framework to implement. If they haven't got the right data, they're guessing. The public sector and the private sector has to work together. So I think it's not an either or, it's, it's having both. Everybody has a place at this table um, because the, the challenge is huge and simply we need everybody to be involved. Although difficult, we needn't face a water crisis. The water gap can be closed sustainably and at a reasonable cost. I do think it's solvable, but we have to act now. So it is possible, but it requires a different kind of thinking and a different kind of momentum. With the right technologies, the right financial structure, and a keen focus on conservation and efficiency, we can reverse the course and alleviate water stresses throughout the world. Together, we must work to solve the water challenge. Our future depends on it. We're already facing the consequence, the economic consequences of water scarcity. Uh, you see some of these, and this is just a, a quick survey over the last decade. Uh, in, in China, there's new regulatory measures on, on extremely water-intensive water businesses. Uh, in China, it actually has reduced industrial production in some regions uh, where there's been short-term uh, water availability challenges. Uh, places that are uh, more isolated, we mentioned uh, Singapore earlier on, are increasingly vulnerable. Taiwan is another example. Um, the semiconductor industry is very uh, sensitive to water availability. Seen in the U.S., uh, as you see images of dry reservoirs, that naturally gets people thinking a lot about uh, the economic challenges of water scarcity, and there's others. Uh, uh, maybe worth pointing out just one in, in India that keeps coming up, where PepsiCo and, and Coca-Cola were invited to uh, depart a certain region because of the 
because of the, the perception of, uh, of extensive withdrawals that were affecting local supplies. What we basically have is McKinsey coming up here and saying, this is a major problem for the world. We know how to close the gap. We know how to solve the problem. It's just a matter of getting the technology out there and getting the solutions employed. And in this room are the companies and the scientists and the engineers and the talent that it's going to take to develop those technologies or bring those technologies to the world to close that gap. We have the need, we have the solution, and in between is the Milwaukee region and all of the skills that we have in this region to solve that problem. Now, of course, whoever is the next governor of Wisconsin will have a lot to do with Milwaukee and Wisconsin's ability to promote itself as the next international water hub. So each of the candidates was brought in to show the crowd that they had a shared mission. Was it a campaign stop? Oh, absolutely, no doubt about it. But it was also an opportunity for each man to tell the crowd that they were all on the same page. I want to go back in time five, six years. Um, and we would have had a meeting like this to talk about economic growth or economic development in this region. Um, and it would not have been held in this, in this room. Uh, it would not have been held in this building. It could have been held in a, in a, in a table or uh, a booth in a restaurant in this community. Uh, because there was very little that was being done at that time to advance economic development in a joint way. And when I became mayor, I thought that that made little sense. Uh, and it really was a reflection on my days serving in Congress, where I saw, and I can recall sitting with members of Congress from places like Denver or Seattle or Portland, and they were talking about how their regions were doing well economically. And I, of course, had been a person who had grown up here and really was more used to the fights that were taking place between the city and the suburbs for many, many decades. Fights over water, over housing, over transportation. You name it, the fights continued, continued, and continued. And I felt that in many regards that was self-defeating. Um, that, of course, as a mayor of the city of Milwaukee, I wanted jobs to be located in the city. But I'd much rather have them located in Wauwatosa than in Walla Walla, Washington. Or I'd much rather have them located in Caledonia than Cleveland. And so we reached out, and I reached out to business leaders and urban leaders and suburban leaders and rural leaders, um, and we developed the Milwaukee 7 the M7 as it became known, um, to really try to advance this region. And the reason for that, again, was the understanding that leaders, business leaders in particular, really didn't get hung up on specifically what side of 124th Street you were on or what side of County Line Road you were on. They wanted to know whether they could make money in their business. That's what it was all about. And that it was important for us to come together to do that and to really, in a very positive way, promote job growth in this area, to create, retain, and attract jobs to southeastern Wisconsin. And that was the birth of the M7. And there were its detractors. In fact, one of the people you'll hear from later in the day referred to this as putting lipstick on a pig. That was his quote. This is putting lipstick on a pig to try to bring businesses together to, to try to promote this area. Well, the pig has done pretty well in some regards because we have had some victories. Now, we all know that the national economic downturn has affected this region just as it's affected every region in this country. In fact, if you look over the last year and a half, of the 101, 101 largest metropolitan areas in this country, 100 of them lost jobs. So it's no surprise that we have not been able to escape that in its entirety. But I am here to tell you that without the Milwaukee 7 and the collaborative efforts to try to create and retain jobs that the situation would have been worse. But I take my hat off to, and I tip my hat to those people, including the people who are involved in the creation of the Water Council, who are not gonna take that defeatist attitude, but who instead recognize that we live in the real world, that this is not an ideological battle, that to the contrary, this is the most pragmatic, practical battle that we can face. And that is how do we aggressively, proactively do everything we can to promote this region? That to me is the ticket to our success. It doesn't mean that we're denying that we have problems because we know we have problems. Everybody in this room knows that there are economic problems, whether it's at the local level, the county level, the state level, the federal level. But all you have to do is look at Time Magazine's cover from three weeks ago. 
And they, what it had on the cover of that magazine was it had a, a license plate for a state government. Thank God it wasn't Wisconsin. It was a generic state license plate. And the letters were B-N-K-R-P-T, bankrupt. And the cover story was how virtually every state, with the exception of North Dakota and Montana, has serious fiscal problems. And we do. The federal government does, the state government does, local governments do. We know that. So the question is, do we fold up our tents and say everything is bad and we're going to accept a lower standard of living for our children and grandchildren in this region? Or are we going to take off our coats and roll up our sleeves and fight like we've never fought before for those jobs? That's the course that I want to take. As a governor of this state, I'm going to do everything I can from day one to be the most proactive and aggressive job that this state has ever seen to create, retain, and attract jobs. And the reason for that is quite simple. The state of Wisconsin needs more jobs where people can support their families. So let's come back to the Water Council and what I think are the strengths of the Water Council. Again, it plays to our strong suit. Let's face it, the fact that we are here is a tribute to not only this lake, but the rivers that, that form this beautiful community. And it's not just Milwaukee. You can go to Lake Superior, you can go to the St. Croix River, the Mississippi River, the Fox River, the Wisconsin River, the Chippewa River, the rivers and lakes through this state that really have provided this state with more natural resources than virtually any other state in this country. And there are businesses. There are businesses that need water in their technology. There are businesses that need water for production. Um, I have said, stealing a line from Lee Dreyfus, of course, we're, we don't mind people taking water out of our lake as long as it's as long as in, in containers no larger than 16 ounces and it is fermented at the time. Um, <laughs> but we do have opportunities here. And we have to seize the moment. And the moment is now. The moment at a time when virtually every community in this nation is struggling to get on its feet in a fiscal and economic standpoint. I am convinced that if we continue with a proactive, aggressive approach that we will emerge from this victorious. I would be the happiest guy in the world if I never hear or read the phrase Rust Belt again. Um, journalists in attendance, please make that note. Uh, and the reason for that is when you think about it, um, Rust Belt versus Sun Belt. Uh, clearly, Rust Belt connotes a much less favorable picture in your mind. Uh, and, and I think instead of letting someone from a southern state define us, it's time we define ourselves. Uh, and I talked before about the venture capital on the east coast and the west coast or even the gulf coast. And I think it's time that we talk about America's fresh coast um, because that's where we are right now. That is our strong suit. Um, and that allows us, I think, to position ourselves. Um, and it's not just the, the, the phrase, it's, it's really how we feel about ourselves. And, and I think as time goes on, you're going to have more and more parts of this country that are literally going to be parched. And, and it's going to be regions like this who were smart, who were innovative, who were aggressive, who were proactive. They created markets that allow the water technology fields to grow. And it will position us in a very positive way in the long run. As governor of the state of Wisconsin, our top priority is going to be to get our budget in, in order so that we can cut taxes because we understand that, you know, independent of all the rest of the conversation that might go on here today, if we do not become competitive in the United States of America and around the world in terms of cost effectiveness of businesses doing business here, we are not going to be able to attract the best jobs and your, your entire effort is going to go away. So when I think about conceptually being governor, top priority bringing jobs to Wisconsin and restoring our economy, of which you guys are a big part of that. When I think about doing that, folks, the first step has to be make us competitive from a cost perspective for the businesses that may consider coming here. If we don't, everything else, everything else is wasted. So when we think about cost competitiveness, I start with taxes. We need to get spending under control, exactly like we did when we were in Washington, D.C. That needs to be repeated. The second thing that needs to happen is education. And this also replates to this industry. Folks, if we can have the best educated kids in the world, we will bring the best businesses to the state of Wisconsin. I've laid out an entire education plan. It specifically addresses education here in Milwaukee. And for those of you that are from the Milwaukee area, you know we have a very difficult situation as it relates to schools here. As a person running for office, so the discussion for education from me is very, very different than everybody else in the races. It's not about power. It's not about control. It's not about politics. 
When you talk about education, you need to talk about the kids in the classroom and how we can improve the quality of the education so their test scores go up and they qualify to go on to school and have a better life for themselves. Folks, when I think about education, I've studied this carefully. We have three choice schools here in Milwaukee that I co-founded, still co-chair the board. They're running, they're providing a quality education at about half the price of the public schools. When I sat down and started running for governor and started looking at this saying, what's going on in public education? We have some really great public schools in the state of Wisconsin, folks, but they cost a bundle to run. The bottom line is our schools spend way too much on bureaucracy and not enough in the classroom educating our kids. So when I lined up these schools side by side, our choice schools here in Milwaukee that are succeeding and the schools that are not succeeding, even and the other schools around the state that are doing a great job out there. When we look at how much money is being spent on the bureaucracy that is never getting into the classroom to help our kids, we need to fix that in the state of Wisconsin. We've got a plan to do that. The third leg of getting our economics into uh, house in order to a point where we can attract business to Wisconsin is rules, regula regulation, and red tape. The time it takes to get a permit out in the state of Wisconsin and the layers of bureaucracy that you have to go through in this state to get anything done when laid up against other states is not acceptable. Now, Tom, I, just, I listened to part of his speech, by the way, he had some very good points. I believe in the state of Wisconsin, as he said, but we've got to get our house in order so that we are competitive not only around America but around the world because we are competing in a world economy today. So if we want to bring business to Wisconsin, we've got to start with taxes, get them under control, high quality education, get our rules and regulations to a point where our businesses can afford to be here. Our universities are actually all over the place. Every one of these big circles represents a four-year institution that we, the taxpayers in the state of Wisconsin, are paying some very fine professors with PhDs in all sorts of different topics. The smaller circles that you see on here, those are our two-year schools. And the stars, the stars all over this, that's our tech schools. Folks, we are sitting on such a wealth of knowledge here in this state. If we can just figure out how to harness that and put it to work, so here's the plan. In North Carolina, they had one great big research park, and it was located between these. In the state of Wisconsin, what I would like to see I would like to see us lo locate at least 10 smaller research parks around the state of Wisconsin. Now, what does that mean in terms of economic development? Well, our economic development team in a Newman administration, I want to put this as a very strange way to go about things. I'm going to accept applications from business owners and successful business people at all levels of business in different areas around the state of Wisconsin where those folks will do what Sue and I and our family are doing, and that is put their business aside for a short period of time to serve their state. So our economic development team will be made up of successful folks from around the state of Wisconsin from the private sector business world. And I'm going to give them two main jobs. Their first job, I want you to go to these other states around the country that are being ranked so good for doing business, Texas and Indiana, states that are growing even in the middle of this recession. And I want you to come back with a very specific list of what they're doing different than what we're doing here in the state of Wisconsin. And I might add I'm a business owner. I got some pretty good ideas. I understand the taxes, I understand the bureaucracy because we deal with it every day of the week. I have to meet that payroll at the end of the week and we get it. But the bottom line is I want it specifically identified so as governor we can change our rules and regulations here in the state of Wisconsin so we become known as the best place in America to do business. That is the vision, that is the goal, and it's where we're going. The second job of our economic development team, and this is very important, I'm going to ask them to go to each one of our colleges and our universities and private will, will be invited in this as well, of course. But we're going to ask them to go to our colleges and universities and quantify the intellectual knowledge that is at these campuses. Folks, if it's not done in an organized manner that we know what tools we have available, you're not going to be able to match it to businesses. So economic development team, let's get us on track to be the best place in the world to do business. And now I want to quantify what is it that we have for talent at our campuses? What are our PhDs' uh, emphasis? Where are they best? Where are they strongest? And now we've got entrepreneurs in this economic development team. They understand what the intellectual knowledge is that we have available on our college campuses. Their next job is to match that intellectual knowledge, that strength, to what businesses can best benefit by that, and then we target those businesses specifically. Folks, this is not a passive plan to let things happen. This is an aggressive home builder who has figured out how to survive in one of the worst economies that we've had and even prosper and grow, this is an aggressive private sector person saying, here is our business plan. We know what we're going to do. We're going to quantify that knowledge, match it to business, and we're going out to get those businesses. And the next time I talk to Governor Perry from Texas, he's not going to repeat the conversation I had the last time. It went like this. I was talking to him about being competitive. He said to me, any job we want, we get here in Texas. 
And I said, well, Governor, why is that? And he started going through things like lower taxes, efficiency in, in permitting processes, high quality education for all of those things. And I said, well, you're going to have to compete against Wisconsin. And he laughed at me. He said, no, I don't compete against Wisconsin. I said, why? He said, well, you have to be in the game in order to compete. You guys are not in the game. You're not competitive today. Well, folks, the next time, the next time Governor Perry is going to say, how come those jobs are going from Texas to Wisconsin because you guys have done such a good job uh, of re restoring your economy. And this is going to be a big part of it, folks. I want you to picture here in Milwaukee a research park. And the specialty of that research park is your industry because you guys are on the cutting edge. We don't want to stay where we are. We don't want other places around to be known as being as good you know, like us. We want to be known as the best place in the world to do this business. And we want to be known as a place that has figured out how to utilize the intellectual knowledge, and I know you guys are doing some of this, expect as governor that we step this thing up and expect that we work very hard that when we attract the new professors to our colleges and universities that we are looking specifically, uh, specifically for people in, with talent in the areas that we can grow jobs in. And picture also two miles by two miles, not as big as the two mile by uh, eight mile out in North Carolina, but maybe two miles by two miles where we are specifically locating new businesses in the state of Wisconsin that are directly related to your industry, where our college professors are assisting in the research and, the de and new product development. And one other thing, when we're done with that development, those production jobs are not going elsewhere. They're staying right here in Wisconsin. And I get a little excited about this. I've left out a part that's really important. And by the way, to me, this is probably the most important part of the plan. If you think about a research park here, doing research on water and advancing you to the next level of technology in your field. And you think about the people, the businesses that are in this park partnering with our school, UW-Milwaukee, and the professors at UW-Milwaukee getting grants for what they're doing uh, to provide this research. One other thing happens that's really important. Our Wisconsin kids at UW-Milwaukee are involved in that research as they are completing their degree. And instead of going to Illinois or Indiana or Texas, the most likely place they're going to be employed is right here at home in Wisconsin in that research park. You guys, that's where as governor I think we need to go as a state. It is a specific business plan to get this state from where it is to where we'd like to see it. The vision is clearly we want to be the best place in the world to do business and we want to have the best educated kids in the world because that's our future. In our case, this is what we'd like to do for the state of Wisconsin. Six simple things that I believe will help the people of this state, not the government, but the people of this state create 250,000 new jobs by the end of our first term. That's a quarter of a million jobs by 2015. And it's simple. It's a, it's a variety of different things. Everything from, from cutting taxes, taxes on individuals, on employers, capping off property taxes, uh, even things as simple as phasing out state taxes and retirement income, which you might say, what does that have to do with jobs? Anybody who's been to the airport the week after Christmas uh, knows the next wave of people going down to Florida and Arizona and Texas and Tennessee aren't just going to get away from the weather climate, they're going away to get away from the tax climate. And that's money that when we talk about startups and angel investors and venture capital that's being invested in places like Tampa and Sedona and Naples and other places outside of the state of Wisconsin that we need to keep here. So one objective is to cut taxes, because I think you look at the states and I just heard Mark allude to a couple, Texas, uh, Indiana, and others that have done that have lowered the cost of doing business. Those are the states, even in these tough economic times, have actually seen job growth, and in turn, actually their state budget's doing better than states like Wisconsin. Uh, secondly, uh, I talked about cutting through uh, the regulatory issues in this state, um, easing through the red tape that comes through regulations, particularly for small and mid-sized employers, um, adding in things that are science-based, uh, in terms of the regulations that we do have, science-based and predictable, uh, with the idea being that if you take out a permit for something, it shouldn't, ta shouldn't take you two days one time, two weeks the next time, and two months the time after that. It should be predictable. Just like everywhere else in life, things are predictable. It should be in government as well. Uh, third, we talked about cutting through the cost of litigation in this state, cutting through the red tape of frivolous and out-of-control lawsuits. Again, if you look at the state's even in the past couple of years since the uh, economic woes started in 2008 in earnest, the states that have passed true tort reform, that have eased the regulatory burden while still maintaining public safety and public health standards and have made it easier to do business by a lower tax burden, those are the states that have seen economic growth. On top of that, I want to have a world-class education system in this state. I think there are ways to do that. I certainly know there are thousands of reasons to be for that. I have two. Uh, they're called Matt and Alex, my two sons who go to Wauwatosa East High School. And I know in this room for every parent or grandparent, anybody who just cares about kids, 
We know how vital it is to have a world-class education system. Uh, but to, to get there, we can't just be um, confident uh, with the status quo. We've got to continue to have advancements, not only here in Milwaukee, obviously an economic hub across the state, but all throughout the state of Wisconsin. Uh, as governor, I'd like us for every school district, for every administrator, and most importantly for every teacher to create a system in the state where we pay for performance, uh, where for those uh, classrooms where the teachers perform well and the students perform well accordingly, uh, we pay them accordingly and we give them incentives and benefits. And for those that don't, we provide mentors to provide them additional assistance. And for those that continue not to reach those standards, we find others to take their place. Everywhere else in life, any of you in business and marketing and retail know you pay for performance. Uh, to me, we should be doing the same when it comes to education. And when it comes to higher education, uh, we should be supporting particularly our individual University of Wisconsin campuses, uh, not just on a system-wide basis, but as I go from campus to campus, one of the common themes and issues that comes up is campuses that would like autonomy. Uh, they'd like to be part of the University of Wisconsin, they'd like to be part of the state of Wisconsin, but they know that certain parts of the state have unique needs and interests and they'd like to be able to account and accustom for those and to make things that fit into whether it's the M7 or the New North or any other place across the state, fit into the economic strategies of that given region and not be bogged down by the administrative overhead, not just in the system but in the state government itself. They could do more and operate more like uh, many of you do in the private sector and business if given the opportunity to do that. As governor, I'd like to advance that as well. We also talk a lot about health care, but not about the way they're talking about in Washington where they talk about access and quality. In Wisconsin, we rank nearly at the top when it comes to access and quality. Uh, our big challenge in this state, more than anything else, is cost. The cost of providing access to quality health care for our employers. And as governor, I'd like to get away from the mandates that come out of Washington and some even these days that come out of Madison and instead open the door for more market-driven solutions, things that allow true transparency and disclosure so when you're making uh, purchasing decisions about health care, you've got a place to go and a place to understand what you're buying into. Entities that allow the government to partner with the private sector to open the door for sharing the, the risk, uh, the pool of, of risk out there through purchasing pools and ultimately things even as simple as eliminating the state tax and health savings accounts to give employers one more option to par provide affordable health care opportunities for them themselves and ultimately their employees. And then the final thing I talk about in any group, but I particularly want to highlight today and, and talk a little bit more in depth, is infrastructure. For me, we need to have reliable infrastructure in this state to fuel the state's economy. It's everything from cost-effective and variety of sources of power that are cost-effective and reliable in this state. It certainly means a transportation system uh, that is up-to-date and moves into the, uh, the 21st century and beyond. Uh, it talks about telecommunications, particularly in some of our most impoverished and rural parts of the state of Wisconsin. But one of the other things I mentioned in front of other groups, not just the Water Council Summit here today, is water. We need only look in this region to know the power, not just through this summit and through the uh, various uh, academic institutions and employers that we have, but just the debate and discussion about providing water to our, our friends and neighbors to the west in Waukesha County, and the balance between that, between protecting our incredible natural resource, but at the same time doing it in a way that might be able to aid and assist the economy of this region. We're the only state surrounded by two great lakes and the greatest river in the U.S. We're filled with 15,000 inland lakes. It's 5,000 more than Minnesota. Eat your heart out, Brett Favre. Uh, when you look at what we have in this state, it's phenomenal. And when you look at our core industries, over the past 162 years of our state's history, it's been manufacturing, it's been agriculture, and it's been tourism. Each of those three industries heavily depend on water. But manufacturing, really, over the years, over most of our history in this state, has been about water in the process of manufacturing something. Not as being the product, but being as a means to get to a product. We have the ability to step that up, not only here in the region, but to export something that is incredibly powerful. At a time when we talk and complain nationally a lot about things, jobs being exported, we have an opportunity to export an economic benefit uh, that the talent and skills that we have here, and I want to highlight a couple different areas, and forgive me, for some reason they, they signal around peas. There's nothing more than it just was consistent. But the first up is what would I do in the future to promote um, the, uh, the water industry here and in the state of Wisconsin? Uh, first off is to make it a priority. You know, in the Department of Commerce in the state of Wisconsin, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of employees. There are all sorts of specialists in things like timber, dairy, manufacturing. There's nothing when it comes specifically to water technology. As governor, I'd like to reorganize through our Secretary of Commerce, the Department of Commerce, so that water 
water technology, the water we are talking about today becomes a part of our economic development strategy for the State of Wisconsin, not just for this region, and that there will be staff actually assigned specialists just like we do for timber and dairy and every other area, we should make that a priority. That is one of the easiest things we can do right off the bat. Uh, certainly, I look on to that and say, in, in addition, we need to protect. Uh, that means that we need to protect uh, the fact that our proximity, whether it is to Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, our lakes, our rivers, and others. So it is obvious things like I think something we can all agree on, protecting and making sure in light of all the talk these days about the golf course that we maintain the ban uh, on any sort of drilling, uh, oil or otherwise related anywhere around or in the Great Lakes. It certainly means looking on things like working with state and provincial leaders to make sure that we address things like ballast water discharges, not on a state by state basis, but on a bi-national agreement. Uh, so that we tap it at the very end by the St. Lawrence Seaway and not when Easters are coming in and through the Seaway and the Great Lakes itself, making sure we address the Asian carp issue. I know that continues to grow and it is timely and hopefully much of that will be addressed even before there is a new governor, uh, but certainly that is a priority for us who value the Great Lakes. Uh, looking at phosphorus and the issue that so many local governments have in dealing with that, uh, the new phosphorus uh, mandates that are in place, but looking at balancing that. I. I um, just the other day was at CH2ML Hill and I just saw a couple of guys here. We were talking about uh, that, about how do you balance that out, helping local governments with and even here in the MMSD and others to a smaller extent in terms of the size, but balancing that, that mandate when it comes to phosphorus, but in the same way of not bankrupting them. Uh, to me, there is you know, a company here in Evansville I visited that is one of the largest producers of, of prairie grass uh, and looking at ideas that might seem old but are new in terms of uh, prairie grass and prairie restoration around areas where water runs off and helping that be a natural filter in addition to all the other technologies we are advancing. Uh, certainly you look at all those things are things that are needed to protect. I would add just a couple other quick things before I get the hook back there because I am watching uh, my, my uh, count off here. Uh, push, pushing research. You know, we have got the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee obviously right here that has been at the forefront of the Water Institute, but that has been largely focused on ecological research, we need to go beyond that and obviously with the, uh, the new focus that so many of you have been a part of in terms of the School of Freshwater Sciences, a key component as governor, I will make that a priority for us to move by forward just as county executive I push with the school engineering which I think keys into that as well, whether it is Marquette with water law, whether it is uh, University of Wisconsin Whitewater or Parkside with it, each of their individual programs, we are going to continue to push for research. I look at profit and say that whether it is the wave concept, the TIF idea you heard talked about, I heard the tail end about a little bit before, I think that makes abundant sense if water is an interesting uh, uh, a way to attract and retain business and certainly a key way just as we do with TIF districts. I would add to that 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 means we need to have water utilities like the one here in Milwaukee and others that keep rates reasonable. I think the rate last fall when I contacted in September the PSC on behalf of any number of, of employers and businesses throughout southeastern Wisconsin about saying the utility rate charges that the city of Milwaukee's utility was pushing were too high and too aggressive. We need to make sure that that is not a barrier uh, and certainly as governor in the areas that we control we are going to act on that. Uh, we look at other issues in terms of, of even things like applying similar standards to what we do voluntarily for Energy Star, having similar standards in place in terms of the efficient use of water technology and being a leader in terms of that. And then finally, just promote. You know, certainly it's what you're doing here today, being a part of the, the M7, the regional economic development component here. But as governor, it's going to be one of those key things. Again, you think about manufacturing, agriculture, and tourism. We need somebody who's going to be a key advocate in promoting those core industries, but also looking to expand those that become a part of that. As governor, it's not something I'm just going to come to once a year at a water summit, but something that through our Department of Commerce, through our investments in our university system, uh, through our uh, efforts to seek to preserve our natural resources, we are going to continue to push in multifaceted ways to help promote this very powerful thing uh, that, uh, that will help us not only protect and preserve these great assets we have uh, that are part of our water base, but also use them to help us create more jobs here in the great state of Wisconsin. This map shows the water stress index. Obviously, red is not good. Blue is, um, is uh, the location where there is less stress. And it is interesting to look at the fact that in the past 10 years, actually the red states have been having a lot of population growth. And I think you have got to ask yourself whether in the future water rich states will become more attractive to population and pot potentially uh, industrial activities. 
Overflows are always a very sensitive topic here in Milwaukee, and rightly so. The situation has actually improved dramatically since the completion of the deep tunnels, despite very heavy rain, 50 years rain, or even 100, uh, 100 years rain in the past two years. Before the deep tunnel, there were about 9 billion gallons of overflows a year. Now, it is down to less than 1.3 billion gallons a year. It means seven times less. You take a look and you see that world population, since when I was born in 51, it was two and a half billion. We're currently closing in on seven, and at current rates, we're going to go somewhere around nine billion by mid-century. Well, as was shown earlier today, the relationship between the number of people on the planet and the energy that we use is related. About 80% of the energy globally comes from those fossil sources that we, that we so depend upon to make our world what it is now. That's why we did this issue on water, and it's not an issue that's going to go away. So in one sense, if you want people to do something, the first thing you have to do is help them understand and help inform them about these things so that they can be better informed and make decisions, just like all of you are trying to do in your work. We're all working together for that cause. And to do that, what we try to do is basically lay out so what is fresh water? It's like, gee whiz, I mean, we're a water planet. How come we're talking about having so little? So we walk through an appreciation of it, and we talk about the rivers and the beautiful waterfalls, but we also talk about the fact that here you have this water planet where 97.5% of it is seawater, and you can't drink it. Now, as any good event planner knows, it helps to have a big name to boost attendance at and interest in any conference. When the subject matter is, let's be honest, kind of dry and cerebral, having a special attraction helps to lighten things up a bit. Okay, how about a TV star? How about a TV star that is intelligent and well-spoken? How about a TV star that has made energy conservation a major part of his entire adult life? He is the chairman of the Environmental Media Association and the Santa Monica Mo Mountains Conservancy. His work has earned awards from numerous environmental groups, and he serves on the boards of many organizations, including the Thoreau Institute and Midnight Mission. He is the Ed in the Planet Green series, Living with Ed, a look at the day-to-day -day realities of living green with his wife, Rachel Carson. His first book, Living Like Ed, hit the streets in 2008, and the second book, book Ed Bagley's Guide to Sustainable Living, came out last August. I want to introduce you, Mr. Ed Bagley, Jr. Thank you. Thank you. I'm kind of known for talking about energy-related matters and uh, saving energy, but as we all know, I hope everyone in this, in this room knows, you know, water is related to energy, and energy is related to water. Indeed, it takes a lot of energy to pump water around, and uh, it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of water to make energy in many cases. So uh, they are greatly uh, related and intertwined. I'm just curious, how many people in this room have seen the show Living With Ed on Planet Green? Oh, good. It's a nice show on Planet Green, kind of a, a how-to guide with my wife and I. Uh, we have a very unusual Hollywood marriage. We have one of the few Hollywood marriages that has a prenup that involves carbon credits. <laughs> um, She's very sorry she couldn't be here today. She's still a little mad at me at a, uh, a gift I got. I got a birthday gift a little while ago. I thought it was a very nice and organic gift, and I, I thought she'd love it. But no, it was too organic, and it, you know, she didn't like it. It was, I thought, a great gift. Um, it was a hemp thong, and uh, <laughs> once again, I'm the bad guy. I'm not thinking of her feelings. I started doing this stuff in 1970. The first year I was in the profit to amount of money uh, that I could have started doing some stuff. You know, I, I was a broke and struggling actor in 1970. I couldn't do much. Pretty soon I had enough money to buy a rain barrel to collect some of my rainwater. And that saved me some more money on my water bill. Pretty soon I had enough money to buy a solar oven to cook some meals and, and cut down the use of natural gas. Pretty soon I had enough money to buy some attic insulation. And I kept moving up the ladder. After 15 years of doing this cheap and easy stuff as a broken, struggling actor, now it's 1985 and I had a serious thing elsewhere inside, some money from other things too, I finally put solar on my house. Not solar electric still, couldn't afford it. It was crazy expensive back then in 1985 and hard to install. Uh, but I put in solar hot water, which is, you know, twice the bang for the buck, 
as solar electric, as most of you surely know. I just kept doing this stuff. And then 1990, finally, I'd saved enough money to, uh, to buy solar electric. And the technology had gotten better. And I put it up in my home. Before they were mandated, I put in the low flush toilets, you know, the low flow toilets, the low flow shower heads. Uh, this is in the late 80s. And took out the lawn the, the day that escrow closed, and it was my house. Get that lawn out of here. You know, I don't live in this part of the country. I live in Southern California. And I don't think I, I don't need a putting green personally. I'm not a golfer. I, don't, I have no ruminants that I'm raising. I don't have any cows to graze. So I don't see any need for a lawn. And I put in a beautiful drought tolerant lawn that is the envy of the neighborhood. And, uh, and there's none of that water uh, that's, in my opinion, wasted you know, in that part of the country on a lawn. And the savings were immediate. I did a system with the following. It takes the water from the tub, the shower, the laundry, and it puts it through a 600 micron filter right away, take out a lot of the hair and soap and you know, uh, other uh, stuff like that and lint. It goes through a, a 200 micron filter, even smaller holes, obviously, filtering out even more. Change those about once a week, you know, clean them out once a week. And then it goes through activated charcoal, coal, actual anthracite coal, and it goes through a UV light to kill the bacteria. Then it goes down into a 550 gallon tank where it's stored. And though I wouldn't drink that water, that water is not only safe for ornamentals, I use it on my corn and my tomatoes and all the food crops, and it's pretty clean water. I took a lot of flack for timing my wife's shower once in the show, which I confess I did. <laughs> I, I've had a lot of angry people coming up to me about that. I will only say I've timed it once and once only. I don't even own a stopwatch. The crew was there filming, and uh, they had a stopwatch. So my wife for years have been saying, I do not take a 15 to 20 minute shower. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Finally, give me the stopwatch. Here it is. Bunk. Exhibit A, folks, right on camera. <laughs> but as most of, if any of you saw the show, I won the battle, but I lost the war. Um, <laughs> Going to be careful those Pyrrhic victories. Uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, what I did also to have a solution to the problem uh, and I took a lot of flack for this, again, apropos of what you're talking about, Rich. I got tired of hounding my wife about the long showers, so one day I had a solution. We filmed it on the show. It was totally unprepared. This actually happened right on camera, as you see it in the show. I'm sawing off my downspout from my rain gutter, and I'm putting this very nice rain barrel underneath the downspout to collect about 50 gallons of rainwater. Right as I'm doing this with cameras on me, Rochelle comes in through the garage, drops her bags, and goes, what the hell are you doing? I said, honey, what, I'm solving a problem. What are you talking about? I said, the long showers. I'm not going to hound you about that anymore. Here's 50 gallons of water, 